and welcome to everyone participating in, in this webinar. Uh, I'm Peter Clough. I've worked in the field of fish oils, nutritional oils for some 35 years now. Uh, and for much of that time, I, I've worked with the guys at, at Milner Field, either as a client or as a collaborator on various research projects. And, and for the past seven years or so, I've been a technical consultant to them. Um, so I would just like to introduce the topic of analysis of fish oils and concentrates uh, with a little bit of background and, and a little bit of history, which I, I think is always worth revisiting sometimes. So to start off, as we're, I think we're all aware, initial fish oil products in terms of their composition basically reflected the natural composition, the concentrations of, of the fatty acids found in the species from which they were derived. Uh, and here you have some examples uh, with the key fatty acids, EPA and DHA, uh, highlighted in red. And, and you can see various sources, the anchovy, um, typically 22 and 9, uh, cod liver oil, roughly equal quantities of EPA and DHA, uh, tuna, which was for many years the preferred source of high DHA products with 22.6 in this example could be uh, somewhat higher. Uh, next slide, please. At the time these products were being developed, um, gas chromatography was really in its infancy. And um, there's a very interesting paper if you want to look at how the techniques have developed uh, back in 1965. Um, Lambertson and Brecken in the Norwegian Fisheries Research Institute were analyzing cod liver oil compositions. And um, as this extract from the paper says, they calculated the results by actually um, measuring the area under the peak um, using this formulation. Um, and here's an example of the equipment which was typically used at that time. Um, even I don't remember this methodology, although I do uh, recall talking to Frank Dunstan about his days of uh, analyzing and then quantifying by counting the squares of uh, graph on the graph paper underneath the peak that had been printed out. Um, and for those of you working in the lab that perhaps might on occasion complain that your integrator is playing up, uh, well, just consider the alternative. Um, I think we've moved on significantly. Next slide, please. So the initial GC analysis of fish oils um, used short packed bed columns. Uh, here's an example of Shimatsu equipment. Um, which I, I do recollect back in the 80s using something very similar. And um, at the time, the standard 1812 fish oil, the Maxipa type, which was the industry standard, uh, was analyzed using this technology and uh, thus established this 1812 uh, product. However, it became apparent that these columns actually underestimated the number of peaks, um, under-identified the number of fatty acids present, and as a result, overestimated the percent EPA and DHA present in the product. And if we went back and now reanalyze some of those 18, 12 fish oils from that time, we would find they were probably more like 16.5 and 10.5 or 17 and 11, less than the quoted 1812. And, and the results were uh, always reported as percent fatty acids or percent fatty acid methyl esters. The development of longer narrow bore capillary columns gave much better separation of the peaks present, gave more precision uh, and more accuracy. However, 
varying run times, column conditions, sample preparation methods, etc., still resulted in varying results on the same samples. Uh, and this highlighted the need for standard methods to be developed, uh, the lead in which was really taken by the American Oil Chemist Society, uh, who developed their uh, standard method for the analysis of fish oils. Next slide, please. It wasn't long before we started to see concentrated forms of fish oils appearing. Um, initial concentrations were typically double that naturally found in the raw materials, uh, typically perhaps a 55% EPA plus DHA product, which might be in the ratio 33% EPA, 22% DHA. However, over time, concentrations, as you'll all be aware, have increased significantly. And now it's quite common to find 60, 70, or 80% omega-3 products, uh, up to 95% pure EPA or pure DHA. So uh, the key parameter in these products, obviously, is the content of the individual fatty acids, and particularly the EPA and DHA. Um, and as we can see from this table below, uh, taken from GoEd data, the, the, the market has increased significantly in a number of sectors for concentrated products. Um, and since the time of this data, last year was 2018, uh, the volumes have increased even further, um, particularly due to the launch of pharmaceutical products. Next slide, please. So, as mentioned, the original analysis uh, gave good qualitative analysis of percent fames, percent total fatty acids. Um, but for a number of reasons, regulatory, labeling, etc., um, it became apparent that absolute measures were needed. We needed to analyze and quantify the fatty acids in terms of their absolute amounts uh, of expressed in milligrams per gram of product normally. And it soon became apparent that there were discrepancies using the traditional method um, up to, of up to 30, 20% on the theoretical content or the known content uh, when analyzed, for example, using the AOCS method. And hence, new methods required development to produce accurate absolute quantity and quantification, such as the EP method, which we'll hear more about. And, and here's just one example of these differences. Um, in this high DHA product, uh, you can see in terms of the area percent or the percent fames, um, very little difference between the two methods, the AOCS and the EP method, 2%. However, in terms of absolute amounts, milligrams per gram, we see significant differences uh, on this occasion, 12.9%, 13% on the DHA contents. Um, between 343 milligrams per gram and 394, so very significant. Next slide, please. So, how, how does this come about, this difference or discrepancy? Well, the, the measurement of absolute amounts requires the use of an internal standard. And for fish oils, um, we usually use C230. Uh, vegetable oils might use something more like a C170. The AOCS method uses one milligram of internal standard uh, in its analysis. And what is most important here is that the internal standard should be not found in the product concerned. Um, but also should show good separation from 
any other fatty acids which are present in order to get a good clean peak and a precise analysis. In addition to using the one milligram of internal standard, the AOCS method uses theoretical response factors in the calculation. The EP method, by contrast, uses much greater amounts of internal standard, 60 to 90 milligrams of C23, plus uh, ethyl EPA and DHA standards, and actual measured response factors. Next slide, please. As a result, the EP method is more expensive, more time consuming, but is more accurate and consistently um, records higher DHA levels, some 15% higher on concentrated products. The differences in nat natural concentrations, EPA and DHA up to 25 or 30% um, are not significant between the two methods. But for samples containing more than 30 percent and certainly the higher concentrates of 40, 50, 60, 70 percent EPA, uh, the differences are quite significant. Uh, and here uh, we can see that demonstrated uh, table three you've seen previously showing the differences, the DHA 12.9 difference between the two methods, the EPA 7.8% difference. And if we look at the differences between the measured and the theoretical response factors, uh, you can see the percent differences between them almost exactly mirror those uh, of the final results for EPA and DHA. So this is uh, demonstrating uh, the reasoning behind these differences being apparent. Um, and as a result, the conclusion of this work is that the AOCS method does give consistently low results uh, for samples with a high omega-3 content, and that for these samples, the EP method is now recommended. With that, I'd like to hand over to Claire, who will give a little more detail on the practicalities of using these methods. Thank you, Claire. Good afternoon. Yes, I'm going to talk about the fatty acid analysis of omega-3s in the laboratory. So, I'd firstly like you to imagine that you have a safe full of money. Now, I'd like you to imagine setting fire to all that money, because that is what happens every time the wrong method is requested for the quantification of EPA and DHA fatty acids in omega-3 concentrates. So why is that? Well, we use two different compendial methods to carry out the quantitative analysis of the fatty acid concentration of fish oils. The first is that of the American Oil Chemist Society, method CE1B-89 for natural fish oils. And we'll, I'll refer to that as the AOCS method. We also use the European Pharmacopoeia method, e, e, 2.4.29 for fish oil concentrates and other omega-3 concentrates such as algal oils, which I'll refer to as EP method. So in both methods, fatty acid methyl esters are prepared. Firstly, esterified fatty acids are hydrolyzed to free fatty acids with methanolic sodium hydroxide. The free fatty acids are then converted to methyl esters by an acid catalyzed methanolysis procedure using either boron trifluoride in methanol or boron trichloride in methanol. So both methods involve the addition of an odd chain saturated fatty acid methyl ester internal standard at the beginning of the analysis. Methyl triclosanoate, a 23 carbon chain fatty acid, is used as this would not be found naturally in the samples we're analysing. So essentially, both methods use the same chemistry to prepare the fatty acid methyl esters. So therefore, why would you choose one method over the other? So one major difference is the amount of internal standard use. 
In the AOCS method, one milligram is used, which is approximately 4% of the total fatty acids in the sample. Whereas in the European Pharmacopeia method, 70 milligrams is used, which is around 15 to 30 percent of the total fatty acids in the sample. So in this slide here, you'll see an 18-2 natural fish oil sample versus a 40-30 triglyceride um, omega-3 concentrate, which has been analysed by the AOCS method. In the 18 in the 18-2 natural fish oil, which is on the top, um, which contains up to about 30% EPA plus DHA, which is about the maximum for a natural fish oil, the ratio of internal standard to EPA or DHA can be as high as 1 to 5, whereas in the 40-30 triglyceride oil, which contains about 70% EPA plus DHA, the ratio of internal standard to EPA and DHA is even higher, at closer to 1 to 10. So, as an omega-3 fish oil concentrate can have up to about 90% individual EPA or DHA or combined EPA plus DHA, the internal standard to EPA DHA ratio will increase even further using the AOCS method, which is why the AOCS method is not suitable for the analysis of products containing greater than 30% of total EPA plus DHA. Ideally, an internal standard should be in a similar proportion to the components of interest, which is why the AOCS method is not suitable for the analysis of these omega-3 concentrates. So now we have a slide of a 40-30 triglyceride oil analysed by both the AOCS method and the EP method. And you can see that in the top slide, the internal standard is very small compared to the EP and DHA. Whereas in the, the the bottom side, the internal standard was more equal in size. So another and probably more important difference of the two methods is the use of external reference standard solutions in the EP method. There are two in external reference standard solutions prepared, one containing the internal standard plus EPA and the other containing the internal standard plus DHA. These are used to determine measured response factors, which are used in the calculation of the concentration of EPA and DHA. The AOCS uses theoretical response factors, not measured response factors. Response factors are very important when using gas chromatography for quantitative analysis. Any variation in detector response will be captured. And the higher the fatty acid concentration, the greater the impact of any variation in detector response. So, therefore, the use of external reference standard solutions to determine measured response factors for EPA and DHA and the EP method ensures accurate quantification of EPA and DHA fatty acids. The combination of the amount of internal standard used and the use of external reference standards to determine measured response factors ensure the EP method is the most suitable method for the accurate quantification of EPA and DHA fatty acids in omega-3 concentrates. Therefore, what does this mean for you? Well, the higher internal standard weight and addition of EPA and DHA external reference standards used in the EP method mean that we we'll have to charge more for this analysis. This can sometimes put customers off asking for the EP method, and they continue to request the AOCS method. But this is actually false economy. The AOCS method does not provide accurate data for EPA and DHA in omega-3 concentrates. You may have to pay for additional analysis. Um, using the incorrect method can be the difference between a product meeting or failing to meet product specification and rejecting batches is costly for the customers. A new batch of product may have to be produced and the product may sell for a lower price. Now, we understand this impact to your customers if a product fails specification and we want to ensure that the correct method is always used. So, when we receive a sample for analysis, if we believe that the wrong analysis has been requested, we will always contact the customer to advise them. We will always give honest expert advice. So please do listen to our advice 
we don't want customers wasting money, we want to actually save them money. So the customer care is our top priority. We value our customers and we want to ensure that the data our customers receive is always accurate and fit for purpose. This aligns with our values and our commitment to quality and ensures that our customers always receive the very best quality of service. Well, thank you very much, Claire. I think now we can move on to Peter, who's going to give us his part two on, on uh, this masterclass in lipid analysis. So on to you, Peter. Thank you, and thank you, Claire, for that uh, really clear and detailed uh, description of the difference between the two methods and the practical uh, side of things. Uh, next slide, please, Laura. So I'd like to now move on to some more recent developments uh, in the products available, the products which are now being produced. And um, as mentioned, the original, the initial fish oil products, which uh, have been around for a long time, were natural oils with compositions that reflected the fatty acids of the species and natural oils typically are in triglyceride form, as we know. Next slide, please, Laura. However, with the development of concentrated forms, uh, this changed, and initial concentrated products were in the form of ethyl esters, typically. Subsequently, products have come onto the market, have been developed in a range of forms, natural triglyceride, reconstituted triglycerides, monoglycerides, free fatty acids, phospholipids. So now we have a much more complex uh, picture. Next slide, please. And does this matter? This, does the form in which the product is delivered, is it really relevant? Well, it is for a number of reasons. Uh, first of all, question of bioavailability. There have been many papers published in recent years on the bioavailability of different omega-3 forms. And um, I've highlighted some references here, which you may care to have a look at. I'm not going to get into the pros and cons of the different bioavailability studies. Uh, results vary, they depend upon timescales, how long supplementation has been, when supplements have been given, what form the supplements have been given in, and this can re result in very varying results. However, if with your product you're making a claim, you're referencing the bioavailability, then for sure you want to know that the product is in the form you, uh, you claim. Next slide, please. Another reason for considering product form is clinical efficacy. Obviously, there's been many, many human intervention trials now using omega-3 fatty acid products. I've just highlighted a few here to show that these trials have been undertaken with products in various forms. So the big cardiovascular products, reduce it, vital, strength, uh, jealous, most of them have used the ethyl ester form, uh, but for example, the strength product using the Epinova product is actually a free fatty acid. Uh, the Domino and Orip studies in pregnancy, uh, they've used reconstituted triglyceride, as did the DREAM study, the dry eye study, and of course the studies uh, using krill oil, such as the studies in joint pain, a predominantly a phospholipid form. So if, as many do, uh, you reference these studies in supporting documentation for your own product, then isn't it important that the product should be in the form that the study was, that the study used? Next slide, please. And finally, there is the regulatory and labeling aspect. 
we all know that as any products become more expensive, uh, there is the temptation for adulteration to take place. Uh, and this can be anything from uh, high value extra virgin olive oil to highly concentrated EPA and DHA products. Um, and in a study published recently in Food Navigator, um, the researchers found and concluded that products supposed to contain higher amounts of EPA and DHA are typically adulterated with cheap ethyl ester ingredients. And these were products taken from the shelf. So again, this makes it all the more important that we can identify and verify that the product form claimed is the product form being used and is exclusively that. Next slide, please, Laura. So in general, straight GC analysis, fatty acid composition analysis would not necessarily tell us uh, very much about the form because as part of the analysis, as you've heard, the products are initially esterified. But there are a number of other techniques uh, which can be employed, uh, which can tell us a great deal more. Uh, we can look at the positional aspects where the fatty acids, the individual fatty acids are found on the triglyceride molecule, and particularly uh, in the SN2 position. And here you see an example of nutrition of positional analysis um, highlighting the uh, SN2 amounts, the amounts of fatty acid found in the SN2 position and those in the SN1 and SN3. Uh, similarly, uh, using thin layer, thin layer chromatography, uh, we can identify the lipid classes present. Uh, here you see an example of a slide showing methyl, ethyl esters present, tag triacylglycerol or triglyceride, free fatty acids, uh, diglycerides, monoglycerides, sterols, cholesterol esters can all be identified using thin layer chromatography. And of course, uh, recent developments in mass spectrometry linked GC, MS, um, has opened up a whole new world of lipidomics where many, many more lipid classes can be identified and uh, product integrity established. So these are some of the newer techniques uh, which we are now employing to identify and quantify exactly which product form the um, omega-3 concentrates are and also to establish the purity of them. And again, I'd like to hand over to Claire who will tell you a little more about this aspect of analysis. Hello, so how do we carry out lipid class identification and quantification in the laboratory? Firstly, we start with a very traditional technique to separate the various lipid classes called thin layer chromatography, commonly known as TLC. We use analytical TLC for a sort of look-see investigational type analysis, and this is used to estimate the amount of each lipid class by the intensity of the spot. From this, we know how much internal standard to add for quantification. So we use preparative TLC for quantitative analysis. For quantitative analysis, before the sample is spotted onto the TLC plate, an internal standard is added to the sample for each lipid class that we wish to be able to quantify. This is usually a synthetic, on-chain, saturated component of the lipid class, which would not be found naturally in the sample being analysed. This can either be one-dimensional TLC for the anal separation of simple lipids, neutral lipids such as glycerides, fatty acids and sterols. And you'll see in this plate we have a full range starting at the bottom with phospholipids, um, monoglycerides, diglycerides, free cholesterol, free fatty acids, triglycerides and cholesterol ester wax esters at the top. So then we also use two-dimensional TLC 
or the separation of polar lipids, such as um, phospholipids, glycolipids, or ceramides. And you'll see in this plate, we have a range of different ceramides and glycolipids and phospholipids. So there are also one dimensional systems suitable for the separation of specific phospholipids, which can be used as rather as an alternative to two dimensional TLC. So, firstly, we have to um, spot the plate. So, for quantitative analysis, we spot the sample onto commercially available glass backed TLC plates coated with a fine layer of silica gel using a glass syringe. And you'll see the analyst here spotting the plate. And then a specific mixture which is called the mobile phase, is added to the TLC tank. The mobile phase consists of a mixture of organic solvents, acids, and occasionally water. And this will vary depending on the lipid classes present and separation required. The mobile phase runs up the TLC plate from the bottom to the top to separate the lipid classes present. An important variable factor in the separation of polar lipids is the control of humidity within the laboratory. This can be difficult or impossible to control and can lead to inconsistent and non-reproducible analysis, which can be frustrating at the end of a day's work. So we control this variable by the use of a temperature and humidity controlled TLC tank, the CAMAG ADC2, which ensures repeatable results from day to day, week to week, and month to month. So after TLC separation, the individual lipid classes are identified against commercially purchased standards and internal reference samples. Selective developing and visualization reagent sprays and temperatures are used to reveal and identify specific lipid class types and particular functional groups, such as phospholipids and glycolipids. And you could see a plate being developed here on the plate teeter. This is um, using phospholipidic acid as the spray. This one here is developing and showing um, different glycolipids. We have a sample here. I think it's a krill oil sample, which contains a lot of all the main different lipid class groups. Well, the plates um, can also be viewed under different lights, such as UV, white light, etc., to reveal the different lipid classes. So to quantify the amount of each lipid class, after the plate has been run in the TLC tank, we'll have to remove the silica from the TLC plates by scraping it from the glass plate. When we prepare, we then prepare fatty acid methyl esters, which are analysed by gas chromatography, and the fatty acid profile data is entered into an Excel spreadsheet to calculate the total amount of each lipid class. In this analysis, the fatty acid composition is also available if the customers require this. So, as well as lipid class identification and quantification, we also use TLC to isolate components during other analysis, such as during the determination of sterols, SN2 positional analysis of triacylglycerols, milk, fat, blood, ceramide, and skin lipid analysis. LCMS can also be used as an alternative to TLC to carry out lipid class analysis, although both methods have limitations. A significant amount of method development time is usually required during lipid class analysis, as the samples that which we analyse are usually developmental type samples, and therefore no two are the same. So, if anyone is interested in this analysis, um, please do get in touch. Just got a, a few different plates here for the different types of products that we've analysed.
Okay, so I'm just going to talk a bit about the other analysis that we can offer. We have a full range of tests that we can carry out for fatty acid, fat composition and fat quality. So we obviously do a lot of um, omega-3, omega-6 fatty acid profile type analysis, but we can also carry out other tests for the quality of the oils and for oxidation parameters and other tests such as um, derols and tocopherols and tocotrienol analysis, which are also very useful in the identification of adulteration due to the very specific profiles that of of the different oil types. Next slide, please. So the other services that we offer are stability storage and testing, and the, our stability cabinets are um, qualified and running according to the ICH conditions. And carry out method development, method validation, and method verification and transfer. And we can also give advice on clinical trial sample collection and handling prior to the start of the clinical trial. Next slide, please. So, and also in the near future, we hope to be able to offer some new tests in the lab. So, it'll be acidanthin and other carotenoid. 2 and 3 MCPD fatty acid esters and glycidol fatty acid esters, and a full range of oil soluble vitamins. So that will be A. And lastly, um, we are developing an alternative to the titration method for the analysis of peroxides for highly coloured oils. Thank you very much, Claire. That was very clear. And now I think I would just like to take this opportunity to talk about some other analytical cap capability that we can provide for you uh, as a customer. So you can maybe have a one stop shop for most of your commercial needs. Uh, and this arises because Milne Food Lipid Analysis is run by James Hutton Limited, which of course is part of the James Hutton family. And within the James Hutton Institute, we have a wealth of experience of many different scientists with many lots of different background who can uh, provide other forms of techniques which can help with many forms of industrial situations. And here's a few examples. So just again on the lipid theme, we can provide a lot of uh, analysis of contaminants which might be present in various lipid samples. For example, uh, the presence of polyaromatic hy hydrocarbons and other persistent organic contaminants which may arise or become uh, 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 present in various oil samples. We can also analyse for residual solvents which may have been used during oil extraction using headspace GCMS. And we can look for other contaminants such as the heavy metals, so there may be heavy metal contaminant in the soils where the oils plants have been grown or have these have been uh, produced during the processing of the oils. And of course, pesticides can be a problem if they, of course, if they are carried into the oils any part during the processing. And in a slightly different area, we can actually analyse for the volatile compounds which are important for the quality and smell of things like mint and basil oils. So next slide, please. So apart from the lipid based areas, because we have this wealth of experience in a lot of plant and natural product research, we can offer other forms of analysis which might be important for your overall product um, composition. So we can analyze for some of the main nutritional components such as protein and carbohydrate content. So that could be starches. We can also analyze for individual sugars and for polysaccharides. So if you have a polysaccharide component of your product, we can tell you what it is and how much of the, there is. As Claire alluded to, we can also analyze for pigments. So for example, the carotenoids, but also the anthocyanins, which you see in many berries and things like betalins, which are present in many of uh, the various root crops. But one of the things we have is the ability to analyze using things like LCMS or GCMS and determine any plant component. And this can have some real advantages. For example, if you're thinking about the authenticity of your product or a product you may want to buy to add to one of your products, 
we can obtain a lot of information by comparing the sample composition of your product against another comparator, a, 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 an authentic one. And the example I'd like to give here is we did some work in the past where uh, um, um, a university wanted to carry out a, a study on the effects of cranberries on a health issue. And they, they had sourced cranberry capsules. And what we found was whatever was in these capsules, there was very little cranberry and very little of the active ingredient they thought. In fact, the main ingredient seems to be raspberry juice, which was rather unfortunate. Another area which we're opening up at the moment is the ability to analyze for cabinoids, and that's the area which we're involved in at the moment. Moving away from this sort of more plant-based area, we have a lot of different techniques which are available for different pro uh, purposes. So we have X-ray diffraction, which is very useful for minerals. And an example there is to look at uh, the carryover asbestos levels into talc. We can use a technique called Fourier transform infrared or infra uh, FTIR, which can give, a, again, a fingerprint of a component to compare against an authentic component to see look at for contaminants. And the last example here is we can use scanning electron microscopy for particle analysis. And the, what we have here is a particle metal found in gearbox oil from a helicopter, which is useful to understand the wear and tear on these important parts of the machinery. And just to pass over there, next slide, please. That's just reminded me that we're actually going to be hosting another webinar following on from a webinar we gave some time ago on problem samples and our scientific solutions, which looks at some of these uh, more um, a group of free techniques which can be used for uh, various other terms of techniques. That webinar is actually available on our website, but the part two of this will be scheduled soon. And in this case, we'll look at real life case studies to demonstrate how these techniques can be applied individually or together to actually bring solutions to your problems. So watch this space and look at our website for that area. So next slide, please, Laura. That is our, our finished our, um, our main part of our presentations. And we'd like to open up now for a Q&A. Uh, so you can put your questions to the Q&A box or you can actually request to be unmuted. So whilst you have a think about that, I can look at the Q&A at the moment. And this one is a question for Claire. Uh, Claire, you spoke about our test coming up, but is there a method for testing for GLA found in evening primrose oils? Or as he says, did I miss that one? Hi, you will, Paul. You didn't miss it. I didn't actually specifically mention it, but yeah, this is um, something that we've done for many years. And probably one of the first things I ever tested was GLA and EPO, so we could certainly test that for you. Okay, I'm just letting just, just to step in there, Gordon, if I may, um, on that point of GLA testing, uh, one of the uh, projects that we worked on at Milner Field was the um, identification of adulteration of evening primrose oils uh, in order to boost GLA levels uh, and indeed in forage oils. Um, so we, we, we have a wealth of experience of identifying adulteration in both evening primrose and forage oils and, and that might be something worth considering. That's great. We, we got a uh, response back from Paul there saying thank you very much and perfect, which is always good to hear. Actually, I've got a question. Really, I'm going to put this on to Peter and to Claire. Where do you see the area which will come out in the future, which is going to be uh, of the, the most importance? I mean, is it going to be a identification of adulteration or is it going to be standardization of the amount of lipids in a particular product? Where do you see the most growth? I, I think um, in terms of the lab and the, the activity there, two, two areas which we'll see a lot of uh, growth in the future is the field of adulteration. It, it's always been with us. It won't go away, and if anything, in some products, the, the problems are increasing. 
Uh, on a more positive note, I see significant development in actual uh, tissue analysis from both human and, and animal trials, uh, where it's increasingly important to see what the effect of supplementation is, not just on blood levels, which has been known and looked at for many years, uh, but specific tissues. Um, and, and I think that will be a growth area in the future. And, and Claire, would you would agree on that? On that? Yes, I would agree, yes. Um, there's a question that's actually come up here from Joseph uh, about which analytical technique we use for our analysis of sugars, and, and I can field that one. Uh, the main technique we use there is an HPLC method, which involves the, well, to use the commercial name, is the Dynet system. So we can analyze for any natural sugar which is present in the sample by comparison to um, standard sugars. And that, that's a very sensitive analysis which we can do on uh, basically any sugar which we can buy. Uh, moving on, this questions have started to appear. There's a question from Jared. Um, for hydrocarbon analysis, you indicate analysis of aromatic hydrocarbons. Would you also be able to quantify saturated mineral hydrocarbons, MOSH, and addition to the aromatic ones, the more? That's a really good question, Gerard. I'm not absolutely certain on that one, but what we can do is come back to that one. Unless, Claire, you have a, an idea on that one. No, it's not something that I would be able to answer at this moment. Yeah, uh, uh, unfortunately, Gerard, and I'll say this out loud, we were meant to have an R um, member of the panel who would have been able to ask, uh, answer that question immediately. But we'll get back to you as soon as we can on that one. And maybe if you can um, supply an email directly to the email address, Laura, would that be possible? Sorry, yes. yes <laughs> Take me sorry. a second there, yes. There's so, email addresses on the screen just now. So if um, the, the pop the questions just to yourself and then we can pick that up. So in that case, Gerard, if you could email me, so that's Gordon McDougall at hutton.ac.uk, we'll find out that for you at the moment. Okay. Uh, there's another question from Paul here. Uh, we sell food supplements to Australia and they require pharma grade analysis and markers, methods for market determination. And, and he asks, if, he presumes the test methods you use are validated, especially there for EPA and DHA. So I suppose that's one for you, Claire. Yes, we obviously can work to good manufacturing practice standards so we can analyse any pharma product. Um, we obviously, our methods are validated, but they do usually have to be validated on individual customers' products because everybody's products are different. So we have to make sure that um, the method is suitable on you know, each product because we can get different products that are high in phospholipids or others that are you know, totally ethyl esters or you know, mostly triglycerides. So we do still have to do validation and that's something that we can certainly do for you. For the methods that we tend to use for the pharma products, it's it's the compendial methods, the European pharmacopoeia or the US pharmacopoeia that we tend to use. So obviously it's not a full validation is required because they've already been validated, but a method verification to ensure that they are fit for purpose in our laboratory is what we would carry out. Thanks, Claire. I, I think that one, Paul, if, if you have any more questions on that, we could maybe come back to that or you could drop us an email just to make sure that we're, we're capturing everything that you need for that one there. And there's some more questions coming in. Another question from Jared. Um, in Asia, we receive reports of residual solvent contamination of omega-3 oils. Can you measure butane and hexane in fish and krill oils for companies that are operating in Asia? I see no reason why we shouldn't be able to measure hexane and butane levels in the oils as long as they've been supplied to us in a closed format that we can then apply the analysis to. So I don't think there's any reason why we couldn't do that. And I'll pass that back to Claire just to make sure I'm not saying the wrong thing. It's not something that we have 
done routinely, but I don't see why we couldn't do it. Yes, certainly. Yeah. I mean, we have the analytical capability to do that, and it's we have done it for our companies in the past. So it may just be a matter of getting the samples here in the correct uh, way. Okay. Okay. Um, any other questions? There's a question about the peroxide value in coloured oils. Will it be suitable for polar lipids, e.g., krill oil? This is really the reason why we're working on this specifically for these highly coloured products such as krill oil. So, yes, that's what the intention is. I uh, know we, we have a really quite interesting question here, and, and it's one that I believe for Peter in the first instance. It says, which analytical technique is used for analysing SN2 positional analysis? Well, there, there are a number of techniques uh, available for this, and um, certainly, as, as Claire alluded to, uh, in that we can do this in a number of ways in the lab uh, using based upon the TLC initially, um, and then also the GCMS uh, methodology. So, for standard oils, which would you recommend at the moment, Claire? We use the pancreatic lipase hydrolysis and then um, separation out of the monoglycerides and analysis by GC for the analysis, yeah. So I hope, uh, Joseph, that that uh, answers your question. I, I know that we have been interested in looking at um, LCMS-based methods for that, but that's uh, an area which we're still very much in development. Uh, and at the moment, it, it would probably be best to be using the methods that Claire has uh, confirmed in her laboratory. So I, I'm looking through and scrolling through. I don't see any other questions at the moment. There's one in the chat, Gordon. All right, sorry. Yes, correct. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah, I, I didn't have the chat open. Very good. Eh? Uh, sorry. Uh, so in plant and animal breeding, there is a need for high throughput, low cost, and preferably non-destructive methods. Are these wishful thinking? And there's a question mark about NIR, so near infrared te techniques. Um, Personally speaking, yes, I think we can approach this as long as we are understanding what the NIR is telling us about the material in question. But it's very easy for uh, infrared light techniques to pick up other matters and we'd have to confirm and validate these sorts of approaches. But yeah, but they can be very useful and, and in particular FTIR systems. One of the main uses that we've had with those is to look at um, processing methods to look at either the enrichment of your final product, as you would expect, or in fact, the removal of contaminants. And it can be very powerful for that, that um, just for example, if you have a protein content in your sample, it will show up very readily in NIR and FTIR, and you can look at how it's been removed during your processing. So, so I am again scrolling down. I, I think Gordon, to follow on from that, these these methods are increasingly being used, um, but it depends on what you're looking for in terms of um, specificity and accuracy of, of output. Um, that generally they will give a broad picture of um, and. I, it used perhaps in validation or whatever, but um, they don't give the high degrees of accuracy that other methods give at this moment. Yeah, I, I think they, they can be quite useful as a, a screening method to make yeah, sure yeah. that you're, in the case of breeding uh, populations, that you're selecting the right ones, but you, you would also have to validate these at a point where you made maybe crucial crosses. So. I think it, yes, a very interesting area and one which we've got a lot of background work in doing, even things like uh, using um, um, visible spectrum uh, work. That's mainly in plant breeding and it's still in quite early stages. 
So I'm just looking through the Q&A in the chat again, and it looks as though we've kind of exhausted um, the questions there. Would anyone like to be unmuted to directly ask a question? Again, you'd have to put it into the Q&A or the chat so we'd know you'd like to do that. But no, I think that's... There's moving. another comment in the chat, Gordon. I think you could see that. Ah, here we go. Right, here's one. Um, did you consider the AOCS method using the Canada Antarctica, Antarctica enzyme for fatty acids in the SN2 position? And that's one I will say I've asked to clear initially. Yeah, this is not something that we have considered at the moment. We haven't, it's not actually the AOCS method that we follow. So we haven't done that. We are sort of we have optimised the the method we use for SN2 positional analysis quite a lot over the years because we've been doing a lot of milk fat analysis with that method and we've had to sort of just optimise it so it works well for those types of um, fatty acids. Right, that's that's clear. Thank you, Claire. Um, I'm aware of the time. And I think that it might be the point where maybe we have to wrap up for the day. Uh, I'd like to thank all the people who have asked questions and who have uh, listened into the webinar. Thank you for your support and your attention. Of course, if you have any questions which arise over the next few days, you can always email them or contact us through the Lipid Analysis Unit. So it just remains for me in particular to thank uh, Peter and Claire for their presentations. And once again, thank you all for your attention and your attendance today. Thank you.